Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, today's video is going to be kind of all about um, ND filters in a way, but also the lack of them and if you can get around um, using your camera without them for some scenes. Um, but also it, it seems to be quite a well-timed um, video for me to do because Jamie Winslow has just come out with a fantastic video about ND filters for very long exposures. Now I'll link that in the description below. It's really worth a, a watch. He showcases some other photographers work that is just absolutely excellent where they've used very long exposures to get rid of people in their busy uh, scenarios and scenes. And it's, it's something I've done before as well. I've done it on um, Sydney Opera House uh, staircase and th steps and things like that, where if you go at sort of, sort of nice times during the day, it's always busy with people. And if you just want to get rid of all those people, you can use these kind of techniques uh, to do it. But I'm going to actually give a credit to a, a fellow forum user, uh, Jeff Casey. Casey Cassie, I'm not sure how you pronounce your surname, Jeff, but really thanks for planting this seed in my brain for a video because um, he mentioned about go about using the in-camera for Pentax, in-camera modes for composite modes for blending as a way of getting around ND filters. Now, I had tried this in the past and, and I didn't feel like it got very good results, but I at the moment I'm, I'm going through a phase where I'm really d detesting my my own setup with ND filters. It's just, they're just getting absolutely out, out of control. I've got... um. I think when you start off with photography, you don't know what you don't know. You just start collecting. And before you know it, you've just got so many step up rings. And uh, it's even worse for me because I've bought into the Manfrotto um, magnetic filter system just to make it a little bit easier to take ND filters on and off or CPLs off the, off the camera. But it's, a, it's just a mess. I've got so many... Um, you know filters now for different thread sizes and that you know there's there's lots of negatives here right for using nd filters like this because you first of all you've got um you got the problem of price you know you're, you're buying more and more and when you start off and you buy a lens and it's maybe like a 49 mil thread you don't really think that you'll you know you, you buy a 49 mil um filter is, is the sensible thing that you think into yourself you don't obviously sometimes have that that foresight to go and buy a 77 mil threaded filter and thinking that maybe you're going to use another buy another lens and another one and you might need that larger one later on so that's definitely been my mistake i've just went through the process of photography just collecting different different filters and it's a nightmare and i use them all the time I use them for things like flash photography to squeeze every little bit of uh, power out of my strobes by keeping under um the x sync speed so I'm, I'm staying out of high speed sync and you get a lot more power out your strobes i use them for waterfalls all the time and things like that but most of one of the biggest pains about them is is the brain power involved with having to pick and choose and select which ones to take i have to look at my lens choice for that that outing which lenses i'm taking find appropriate step up rings and it's just a huge problem that just takes forever so i need to make a decision for myself if i'm just going to just get rid of them and um downsize to maybe a variable uh, nd filter which i did try to to begin with but i found it to be really poor quality i had that kind of whole x mark kind of stitching across it it was 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 awful but i've since learned that they you do actually get very excellent um variable nd filters they will cost you an arm and a leg though but they will have hard stops in them and some of them each actually tell you that they, the amount of stop um, that you're using um, when you twist it, twist it around. So that might be where I'll go eventually with all of this. But for now, for this video, it's it's really about uh, in camera and, and specifically uh, related to Pentax um, because that's that's a camera I use typically for my wildlife, uh, not wildlife, my landscape uh, shooting. Now, I don't think this this video is just for pe for Pentax users. I think um, this Fuji that I'm um, Fuji XT4 that I'm recording on, I had a little quick dive into the menu. It does seem to have some kind of um, interval composite mode or blending or smooth blending mode for long exposures. I'm not too sure there, but I wouldn't be surprised. I, uh, I would be surprised if other brands um, don't have something similar. I, I can't imagine Pentax being the only camera that has these kind of uh, blend modes, but maybe it is. Maybe it's unique and that's, uh, yeah, you go Pentax for being being cool and unique like that. But um, the, we've had some trouble here in the Blue Mountains recently. We've had a, a lot of rain. Um, a lot of the national parks has been closed, so it's been quite difficult to get out. Um, I managed to get out over the Easter period, and um, I've got a few rivers and streams nearby, and I started testing there, and eventually um, I was going to call it quits there, but I'm actually glad I did actually try and find 
even just some small waterfalls to test this on because uh, just goes to show you how different water can be in different contexts and whether certain things will work or not. So that's what we're going to do now. I'm going to stop talking right now. We're going to um, go and look at some um, images and uh, take you through the sort of modes that I use in the camera, how, how you can set this up with your camera. I used the Pentax K1 for this, but I'm sure it will be usable on lots of other different Pentax systems. And we're going to look at some images and compare the results. And you can decide for yourself if you like what I managed to achieve and whether you think it's actually actually doable to get rid of the ND filter. Because the other thing that about ND filters that's annoying is is I, I quite often like to use a CPL, um, circular polarizer, when I'm in the field to knock out reflections and things like that. And then if you want to then add an ND filter onto that, you're starting to stack um, filters. And for some lenses uh, where you've got a built-in hood, stacking is not really possible without bringing in severe vignetting and other problems. So it is really one of those things that, you know, if you can do away with an ND filter, maybe just make use of a CPL filter for the senior facing and use these kind of in-camera um, tricks, then um, it, that could be a wonderful thing uh, uh, to get around and actually improve your image quality. So, um, so it's definitely something that after this experiment I've explored, I'm starting. I'm going to seriously start uh, looking at it more and more and and see how far I can go with this. So, let's get a look at uh, some images now, and we'll, uh, we'll we'll pick up there. Um, I'll just toggle me off at the moment, just so you can see this a little bit easier. Um, up here we have the um, first example. This is a river or stream near where I live, so this is fairly easy to get to. Um, this is a single frame here, so it's the base frame. Um, whoops, one eight hundredth of a second f eight ISO two hundred. On the right here we have the ND filter, and we're looking at an eighth of a second f eight two hundred. And then down here we've got two interval shots, and this one is a composite of ten, and this one's a composite of twenty. And these were both taken in in average of twenty. Um, sorry average composite not uh, not um, bright or additive uh, but average so when we just look at them at a glance i i personally feel as though um i don't like the freeze motion here um i do actually quite like fast shutter speeds for rivers but it needs to be faster than this i feel like to really freeze water properly you need to get right up high about one one thousandth of a second or more to really do a good job anything in between that it doesn't look too great if we're going for slow, then this is fine, but I think this is kind of done to death a little bit in the, the waterfall and um, stream kind of forums. I think there's a better medium to be had, but uh, it does go to show you that I probably though it's still the, the favorite out of these. Let's have a look at these ones a little bit closer. So if we look here, this is 10 and this is 20 combined together. And there's not a huge difference between them really. I think we can see over here, that on the 20, it's a little, it's blending in a little bit more versus, you know, the, the 10, but we can still sort of see droplets frozen in, in the air and the time. We've got that a kind of frothy look to things um, around here. And even when we do look at 20, we can still sort of see things frozen in time um, a little bit in the, the droplets. So it's an interesting result. Um, let's have a look at this next one. I'll just uh, toggle me back. So see me okay so this one here is a different stream near where i live and um again we've got the base frame here one six fortieth of a second f8 and we have an nd filter here on the right um which is uh one second yeah maybe just one second and um this one over here an interval at 320th of a second and i couldn't recall how many I actually used here this this was one of those examples of where i forgot to tick the save process box I think it was maybe about 15. I, I honestly can't remember, but this is why I said before, it's not a bad idea to begin with, to tick that save process box. So when you can get home and study that your results, you can kind of figure out where the sweet spot is and, and, and you're not, you know, doing too many shutter actuations that don't really assist any, any further with the result. But, um, if we look at these two again, overall, I'm, I'm kind of enjoying the ND filter more. Um, let's just have a look at, uh, compare them a little bit side by side. Um, I'll just toggle me off again. So here we have got the the average um, composite here. And it's kind of an interesting result, isn't it? It's, it's very kind of frothy, bubbly. Um, when we compare it with the, the ND filter here, I think we've definitely got a better shot here where we can sort of get some more context of the direction of, of the water flow. And even down here, we've got these kind of interesting lines going on. Um, but for, for this one, it's just a strange kind of result, isn't it? It's kind of 
frothy and almost like a jacuzzi or something like that. It's not that it's, it's, it's bad or, or not desirable. In the right settings, it could be quite, a, quite an interesting uh, technique to use, but probably I'm still preferring a kind of ND filter approach to this. Um, these next shots here, we have, um, I was actually going to call it a day um, after just doing these river ones here, um, but I'm glad I waited a week and, and the national parks opened back up a little bit and I was able to get to waterfall because I felt as though this actually changed things quite a little bit, um, not a little bit, quite a lot actually, as to the result of, the, of this technique. So here we have um, single frame, um, F11, um, six of a second. And this is, this is again, now ND filter. And we're already seeing that just with the available light, I was already to get a kind of slow motion just from a single shot anyway. But here we do have a 30 second with the ND filter to compare. We can see it's a lot more um, ethereal and kind of hazy um, a kind of effect, but it, it's overkill probably, you know, this was absolutely, absolutely fine in my opinion. Um, when we compare all three of them together here, what I did do is, is go down to f4 this time and um excuse me and um just so that this was about one thirteenth of a second or one fifteenth just so we could compare the results a little bit better from the other other options that we have here i like to think of aperture as something that you know is is something that you use as as a as a artistic choice that you don't use aperture to control your exposure i try not to use that i try and control the exposure purely through shutter speeds and iso um i usually want my aperture to be the right aperture for the scene i'm facing and not actually use it to, to control the exposure but for in this case i was just breaking that rule there let's have a look at these a little bit more so we've got the average composite here of 20 shots and we've got a 30 second ND. And I think when you compare these two, it's not too bad actually. They actually look very similar. We can see that, that there's a few more lines here in texture and it's a bit more hazy. In some ways, I actually might even prefer that the average results compared to the ND filter here. It's done, it's done a pretty good job. It's made an interesting image. Um, let's move on a little bit. This shot here is another waterfall on this walking track. And we have the single frame up the top here. And I think this was F8. Yeah, F8 somewhere. And um, this is an average composite of 20 um, built together. And then this is the ND filter. And again, so when we're, we're looking at these two, there's not a huge amount in it. Um, I feel as though, again, the waterfall, it's really suiting this average composite mode. It's quite incredible to think that, you know, these were taken without an ND filter. And this was taken at the same shutter speed as this one over here. So once you combine 20 shots, of this you end up with something looking like that so i thought that was pretty pretty interesting pretty cool let's have a look at some more okay now this one is interesting i'll just toggle um me off again so this was a single frame this is a 12 times average and this was a 12 times bright so this was the first time i was starting to mess around with the with the bright mode um let's just have a look at single frame here now we can see that this fern is, is crisp and the fern over this was the focal point here and the the fern here is blurry and the fern here is very blurry now I've, I've done videos about how you, you tackle this in post-processing so that you can take an image like this where the fern is crisp and blend in the water from this scenario into here or the water from here. But let's just for a minute ignore the fern at the moment and just pay attention to the water. And we can see here that the average is starting to blur things a lot and get things a little bit more ethereal. But the bright is really interesting because what the bright seems to do is just collect and add more bright parts and onto the frame rather than, uh, than rather than averaging it so these shutter speeds are still quite quick we can still see the texture in the water but it's it's thickened out and added and we can even see down here this this area is brighter here than it is down done in these ones over here it's quite an interesting technique and what i did actually is do it do a bit of a gif this one here is this is the additive i believe not additive this is average build up so this is showing all the frames it's a little gif um and i'll have i'll link these on the, the the website so you can have a look at them but this is um a little little gif here of the water flow as it's going through it's, i think this is about 19 images so it's showing you the build up as it's going along um and then this one over here this is bright now i think this one is an interesting this is only about I think 10 shots, but you can see it's starting to add more and more white parts as it's, as it's going along. It's subtly different from the average. And in some ways, it's, I think it's preferable. It's, it can make a small stream a more thicker and fuller 
waterfall, not stream, waterfall, it can make it more thicker and fuller in its results than the kind of aforementioned version, which keeps it the same and just kind of blends the, you know, the next layers on top of one another. This one feels like it's actually adding more water, more little streams onto that, that water flow, which I thought was really quite interesting. And then the last one here is additive, which just just things just get brighter and brighter and brighter and I really haven't worked out where in what instance you would maybe use this mode for yet so I thought this was quite an interesting one to to just kind of show you so you've got yeah bright um sorry you've got additive there and you've got bright which seems to just add more bright parts as as it as it builds up the image and then you've got the average which is just uh yeah, averaging everything and building it up. So anyway, I mean, that, it's a quick video. Um, I just, that is my experiment so far. Um, and uh, I just really wanted to, to to leave it there really for today. And um, I hope you found this useful. I would like, yeah, leave some um, comments below if you found this useful or you found situations where this has worked well for you or not. Um, I'd love to know uh, where maybe additive would be um, useful. Uh, as a technique to use this in camera and before I go I will um, as promised I will just do a quick technical of how to set this up in camera and remember when you do this and you set this up in camera you can always save this to a user mode so that you don't have to think and think about doing it in the field when you're out you can just bind it to use mode number one two three four or five so it's, it's there for quick reference next time you want to use it all right thanks very much Okay, so to do this, you need to um, go to the drive mode, which is the top D-pad button there. As you can see, mine's is currently set to high um, burst mode. So you push that D-pad button in and you're gonna get to all the various different drive modes. Now, the one we're looking for, for this type of work is going to actually be on the interval shooting. Uh, not so much the multi-exposure, although that's very useful. It is a little bit more manual and you will need to um, press a shutter every time you want to take a second shot and a third shot and fourth and so, so on and so forth. So that's a little bit laborious. So this one here is a little bit more automated and what we're looking for is actually interval composite. We, we want the camera to do the merging in camera for us. If you don't want that, you would use interval shooting. That can be very handy for, um, if you're going to do this kind of merging in something like Photoshop and perhaps you've got a, a problematic frame. Um, maybe you've done 20 images and one of them is really bad and you don't want it in the shot, um, then this would be a good mode to use to remove that, that dud frame and continue building the rest. And that's been quite useful. I've used this one for things like getting rid of tourists around um, Sydney Opera House and things like that. So, so you can use either of these two. But for something like a waterfall, I think that the composite mode in camera is absolutely fine. So um, we hit the info button here. And then the interval, I just usually leave uh, at that. That I think that just basically means it's as soon as it can, it's going to take the next shot. Um, the number of shots, the number of, of pictures. Yep, that's just where you specify how many you want to do. Whoops. Um, here. Hang on a minute. It's been annoying. And so you specify how many you want. So we'll just do, say, 15 or something like that. And then down here, you're telling it whether it's 12 seconds delay before the first shot, two seconds, or remote control, etc., etc. So we'll just leave it on that. And then down here, the composite mode. And you've got three. You've got average, you've got um, additive, um, additive, sorry, and then you have bright. So uh, typically, average is probably what you're looking for. But bright uh, is actually quite useful, and, and we'll see about that later and why, why bright could be actually uh, maybe a bit underrated and quite good for this kind of thing. And then the last box down here is we have um, save process. Now, what this box does is create a subfolder on your SD card containing all of the shots that you specified up here. So in this case, it would be 15 shots. So that's quite useful because if you've done a, a blend and you're not really too sure, you know, if you, if you used four shots, 10 shots, 20 shots, 50 shots or whatever, then to actually just tick this box, you can just go into the subfolder, count how many files there are, and you know, therefore, you know what your blend was and how many shots you took well otherwise if you leave this box off you're just going to get one image on the sd card which is fine obviously save space but you're not really going to know how many shots we used to, to create that, sh that that shot so save process can be useful the other thing about save process to be aware under this composite mode remember though is say if you're looking at frame number five it's not you're not looking at the shot number five that it took you're looking at shot number one to five that it took it's all the pre the previous shots as well merged together so this is quite useful if you 
feel as though you, you've gone too far with the blur or the, the blend or whatever it is and you know 20 was overkill and you know 6 was fine or something like that then you could pick a, an earlier version file to work off from but um, otherwise yeah I do recommend at least to begin with maybe keep it on to help you, you you keep yourself straight but as you as you get more advanced with this you might decide you don't need it you can just save a bit of space on SD card and turn it off